Okay. Hey, it's Greg Stanley with the Collector Car Podcast. I am super excited with my guest today. Today I have Matt Farah of the Smoking Tire joining us. Matt, how are you doing today? Great. How are you? Thank you for having me. I'm doing fantastic. I've been a big fan of your videos, your podcast, and you're doing a bazillion automotive types of things. So if you would, could you tell our listeners kind of where do all of those tendrils go to in the car world? <laughs> yeah, there's like an oil drum with like little hoses in it on trickle. That's how I'm, that's the, that's the gig economy. No, I, I do car reviews on the Smoking Tire YouTube channel. I do the Smoking Tire podcast, which you can get uh, where you get podcasts or on YouTube slash the Smoking Tire podcast. Um, I write new car reviews for uh, Road and Track magazine, and I own, am the owner of Westside Collector Car Storage here in uh, Playa Vista, California. Yeah, that's incredibly awesome. And you've probably driven more cool cars than anyone I've ever met. So if you had to guess on how many different cars you have driven over the years, take a wild guess. Is it I mean it's like it's like somewhere between 1500 and 2000. Okay. Yeah, it's it's I I don't know if it's I stopped counting. I mean the num the number of car reviews is like 1800, but I don't know. Wow. I couldn't tell you how many cars I've just taken a spin in and not not written, but it's it's been a lot. <laughs> it's, it's a it's a lot. Yeah. So I didn't mean this for part of the interview, but I'll ask it anyway. Is that looking back at all those interviews or, or those reviews of cars, are there any that were just absolutely horrendous? Cars? Like obviously, there's not a great. Yeah. Yeah. Like ones that just I stick mean, out your whole. Yeah. But like, well, here's the thing you know, to get to that number, I drove people's personal stuff. Like, oh, it's yeah. not like I drove 1,800 brand new cars you know for provided by manufacturer for review there's probably been three to four hundred of those you know what i mean right because right. you know i've been doing this 12 years you know i get a car for a week at a time you know the, the i don't remember I, I couldn't do that math but 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 with people's the, the worst ones i've ever driven were cars that were owned, built, modified heavily by individuals of incredibly <laughs> limited experience and, and in some cases, incredibly limited competence. <laughs> Probably that's, made for an interview. Uh, interesting review, though. Entertaining, right? <laughs> well, usually, you know, um, you know, uh, in hindsight, you know, because uh, it, in, the, in, in those cases, I'd have the the owner of the car in the car with me. I mean, that was the thing, right? Was I'd yeah. be driving these cars on camera for the first time and, and the owner would be in the car with me. And so there's only so mean I'm willing to be when the, the person is sitting, you know, right there, you know? And, and so in, in pretty much every case, when I drove something that I really hated, I was, in my opinion, incredibly charitable <laughs> um, <laughs> over, you know, and, and part of that is the re part of that, oh, excuse me, that's part of the reason that I don't really drive people's personally built cars anymore. And I haven't for a few years because frankly, it's, it's, it's not that rewarding for me anymore it was it was a strategy that resulted in success and money you know but it was not that intellectually right. rewarding to judge someone's build to their face you know uh on camera and go here's <laughs> here's me and here's dave and we're in dave's car now did dave do a good job like let's find out you know there's not there's <laughs> there's an entertainment value for sure but there's definitely not a lot of consumer value and there's not a lot of like depth to that story it's 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 a bunch of first impressions right and so with new cars you know a you're talking about hopefully a new product so there's more to talk about than just revisiting an older car and you also i i take the car home i use it in my life i go to the store i go to work i you know i go to the canyons i do i do a bunch of different things with it and so by the time i film the review usually on the last or second to last day I have the car, I have a breadth of topics to talk about that are a little more different, right. you know, a little more interesting than how's the power, how's the brakes, you know, did this kid ruin it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, yeah. and so, so it, uh, but as a means to 
creating an assembly line type process where I could review six or seven cars in a single day, I couldn't have done it without those individuals being willing to bring me their cars. And so once I discovered YouTube was that much of a volume model, I chased that until I, you know, flamed out <laughs> mentally. Right, right, <laughs> mentally. right yeah. yeah. Well, what are you driving this week? What cars have you been in? Are you driving anything, testing You know, anything I'm, I'm going to disappoint you because this past week I was driving a Volvo Cross Country, a uh, V90 <laughs> Cross Country, because my parents came to visit for the first time in many months, and uh, I was shuttling my parents around and doing all kinds of activities. Uh, this weekend I have a Harley Davidson press bike, and it's a Fat Bob, and it's the first time I've ever ridden a traditional Harley Davidson. It's my wow. second Harley, but I rode. I was on the Pan America last week, their new adventure motorcycle that's very cool and very modern. And if you took the the Harley Davidson badging off it, you know it could be a KTM or a BM a BMW or an Aprilia or a a, a, a Moto Guzzi or any any kind of. Um, you know, medium level adventure touring modern bike. And it was very cool. So I asked them if they would send me uh, a traditional Harley so I could have a go in, you know, one of the more old school style bikes. And, right. uh, and on Monday I get the, um, the new Mustang Mach one, which should be fun. Yeah. Those are good looking. You're a Mustang yeah. guy, right? Um, well, I, I don't want to say I'm a guy or any kind of a guy. <laughs> um, I have, if, um, if we have, if we add up all the vehicles that I've owned throughout my life, as it turns out, I have owned more Fords than anything else, um, and I'm not entirely sure why that is. It's not because my parents drove Fords or anything like that, um, and it's not because I'm particularly aligned with any specific thing about Ford. Um, but it, you know, I, I did have a Mustang when I was a kid that we, that we built up and modified. And I then had a Fox body that I had about six, seven years ago that I modified and we were on the cover of car craft and that was pretty cool. And, and I, I sold it in, in the great clean out of 2015 when I lost my building and had to get rid of all my cars, uh, hence building a giant car storage facility. But, um, but I also, you know, I had a Fiesta ST, I had a Raptor, I had a Focus RS. Um, I now I now own a Mach E, the electric one, um, and so I, I I I had a Mercury Mountaineer, um, which is all kind of a Ford, you know, the, it's the Mercury Explorer when that was a, a thing, and so I guess yeah, I, I I've had I've had um, a variety of new, cutting edge, and exciting. Ford products, yeah, right. But I also owned a Corvette and a Volt, right. So I've had okay. I had two cutting edge, exciting uh, GM products. You know, I, I tend to buy um, cutting edge. If I'm buying a new car, it tends to be a, a, a cutting edge, exciting, you know, new car. Yeah, and then I have so a bunch of weird old stuff. Uh, how would we pair the Mach E to the Model Y? I'm sorry, could you? Uh, you broke up just a little bit. Say that again. How would you compare the Mach E to the Model Y? Oh, the, uh... um, it's um, well, you know, so you don't have you know the supercharger network, right? Um, which is a which is a downgrade for the for Ford. Um, I don't need public charging. I have I have chargers here at Westside Collector Car Storage. So one day a week on the juice, and uh, and we're good with that. Um, in my opinion, the Mach E is just like a Model Y, but it's screwed together better. <laughs> okay, that's that's that's, that's that's my opinion. It's built it's built it's built better. Um, in a lot of other ways, it's it's almost exactly the same. You know, indistinguishable. You know, it has a tablet. Um, I think Tesla's system is a little more refined, uh, and Ford's system will get there. Their, their software interface, um, they have over-the-air updates, and we've already gotten a couple of them. Um, you know, I think Tesla's big tablet system has had, uh, you know, the 12, uh, 10 years at this point, um, you know, of, of refining that software. And so it's a little bit uh, more stable than the Ford one is, 
you know. But um, I think uh, the driving experience of the Ford is really nice. Um, the space, the usability, the stereo, the Bang & Olufsen stereo. Um, it's it's a, it's a really nice product. I'm so far I'm I'm very happy with it. I'm about to write a I think I'm about to write 1500 words for my first 3 months with it for carbibles.com in the next couple of weeks. So I'll have a piece coming out uh, about that. Surprisingly, I haven't made any videos with the <laughs> I made the, I made I did a review of the press car and then I went out and bought one. Um but I but I did not I haven't made a video with my personal one. Yeah, I, they're good looking cars. I think they did the uh, you know the Heritage Mustang brake lights pretty nice on that that Mach-E. Yeah. I thought it looked good. By yeah. far the worst thing about the Mach-E is that there are horses on it. Like, <laughs> yeah, like they could I have done it. I, I would. I pr- I don't call it Mustang. I would prefer it was just Mach-E with some kind of styling cue that wasn't a horse. But yeah. you know, you know, I understand why they did it and um, you know, it do- it obviously didn't keep me from buying the car. So, yeah. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Well, the reason I asked why did you how many cars have you driven? How many have you tested? All that kind of stuff is because you're here for our Ultimate Garage series, which is where I shoehorn you into 10 cars that would be in your Ultimate Garage and of you know, I didn't realize I didn't realize I, you were trying to, to get me to there. Maybe you should. <laughs> I wouldn't have taken such a hard left. I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't really get so no, defensive no. about my Fords that I really like. <laughs> hard lefts are fine. Hard lefts sorry. are fine. So sorry. no, I just want to the listeners to understand. You know cars. Sure. And you really know about driving cars and experiencing cars more than even the average car expert. I would say so. I really right, appreciate but you didn't say, on. you know, just so you know, you didn't in the email, you weren't like come up with 10 of the cars you've driven from your real experience. So there's no, cars on my list that, that I have not actually driven. Does that matter? No, because in my ultimate garage, nine of the 10 cars I haven't driven. So, yeah, that's not. OK, that cool. Matter all right. All right. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so let's dig into these 10 cars. I got the list in front of me. I got some of the Haggerty values just to give our listeners an idea. I'm not a cheap date. uh, No, no, you're not a cheap date at all. (laughs) I am am not a cheap date, man. (laughs) Why don't we we start with the big ticket item instead of leaving that for last? I start wherever you want to start, man. Let's do the uh, McLaren F1. Right, not. That, sh- I mean, not. Uh, not shocking. McLaren F1. I mean, if you're no. <laughs> someone, if you're someone my age, you know, I'm 39. You know, the McLaren F1 is it. It's the game over, right? It's the. It's the. It's the. 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 The king of analog. Uh, you know, supercars and um, very rare, justifiably so. I drove one very briefly in not. Uh, not in anger at all, and it was the <laughs> coolest. Um, and I had a go. I had a ride in one at a, a next up level of sport, and it was just extremely excellent. And uh, you know, the the game over, really. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. And and I'm really, I'm really finding it interesting. You also picked the Ferrari F40. Reason being is I interviewed uh, Wayne Carini. He picked an F40. He did not pick an F1. And then McKeel Haggerty picked an F1 and not an F40. You've picked both. So why did you pick both from the same era? Are they that different of a drive different of a driving experience to make it worth your while to have two spots in your ultimate garage? Oh sure. Yeah, of course they're they're different. The F40, I mean the F40 is not a modern car. It's an old school car. It's you know, it's got the gated shifter. It's you know, it's got 328 bones and I or 308 bones, you could say. And I and I own a Ferrari 328, so uh, I can't afford an F40, but I love Ferraris of that era. Um, and I wanted it with my car. I didn't. The 308s are really slow. The the extra power and torque of the 328 made a difference to me. And so I have a 328, and I love it. I drive it all the time. And you know, of that that era you know the the ultimate is is the f40 but it's an old school car um the uh, the mclaren f1 is a transitional car um the engine is more modern um certain the gearbox and certain other things about it are much more modern but at the same time you know compared to today's cars it's still old school and and analog um um, for sure and i mean any any real drivers uh car collection if if you're talking about fantasy playing and unlimited money is is highly likely to include both of those items 
Sure. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yep. Now, our next one on the list, talking about old school, is one that's in your garage currently. Tell us about the Countach. Uh, my Countach is an 88. Um, I've owned it for about three years. It's uh, it's not just my favorite car that I own. It's probably my favorite thing that I own. Um, it is is very fun to drive. Um, it's it's red with gold wheels and, and a tan interior. Um, it, uh, I, uh, it, it's got, it's a very Hollywood car. Um, not just in general, my car specifically, it's done commercials with Cindy Crawford, James Corden. It's been in photo shoots with Diddy. It's been in a, a Muse music video. It's currently in the Ralph Lauren, uh, campaign for the red cologne with Ansel Elgort from, from baby driver. <laughs> nice. Um, and it's, uh, and I drive it a lot. It's, um, it's, I, I take it out. You know, at first, when I first bought it, I drove it once a week. But but as I my shop opened and I bought <laughs> my Ferrari and other stuff, I, I can't do it once a week. But I take it out probably probably every two every once every two to three weeks for a, a really good fifty to eighty mile uh, run. And um, you know, it's just fabulous. You know, it's where wherever you go with it, uh, you win. You you you're the winner. I mean, <laughs> any cars and coffee. You show up in a Countach. You, you you know you you win. Um and uh, <laughs> and mine has some extremely cool features because, um, my the first owner of mine was a guy named Albertoni who is sort of famous Lamborghini tuner from the eighties, seventies uh, and eighties and even into the nineties a bit, and so it has this prototype Albertoni exhaust on it. Um, it also has these remote door poppers, so you can actually pop the doors open on a remote fob from like across the street. Wow. I've never seen another Countach that has that, and I freak people out with that. Um, you know, it's got the <laughs> Alpine stereo and the wing, and um, it's just it's just the coolest. And and it's a little clunky when it's cold. You know, when the fluids are cold, there's a lot of fluid in the car, a lot of oil, a lot of coolant. Um, but once heat soaks through the engine which takes about 15 minutes of driving um it's as fabulous as anything i mean it's just so nice to to row the gears and rev the engine to 8000 and and uh and i drive it and once i got over being you know when i first bought it i was terrified of it you know cuz it was the most expensive thing i've ever bought by pff, a lot other than my house and um but once i got over the fear and started driving it a lot. The last owner didn't drive it very much. And so I started driving it a lot. And after a couple months of really driving it a lot, the car was kind of like, oh, oh, this is what this is going to be like? And it just, right. it all of a sudden became, it warmed up faster. You know, the, the, the temp, it idled really smooth. It just, it fires on the first crank. You know, it's, it's not a pain in the ass. It's cost me very little money to keep it going. The miles, in my opinion, have been very cheap. And meanwhile, the value in the car has gone up, and that's not its not why I bought it. Um, I, I had hoped that that would be the case, but that certainly wasn't why I bought it. In my opinion, whatever miles I put on it hopefully will be offset by the desirability of, of that car, which is extremely, extremely high, fortunately. I mean, it's a, it's a very desirable car, um, but it's... I don't. I don't ever really want to get rid of it. I mean, it's so fun to take it out. Like it's. It's. You know, I have people in my life that it's like all they ever want in their life is to go out in it once. Right. Like, please take me out in it just once. Like people lose their shit, and then to go out and not and not just like up the road, but I'll take them in the canyons and we'll go. For, you know, we go for a run. You know, we, we, we I run the car, and they're like, oh my god, like they can't believe I'm out there. You know, mobbing a Countach through the canyons, and it's it doesn't disappoint. It does not, that car does not disappoint. I think it. I think its reputation as being not good is not correct, really at all. Yeah. Now you obviously probably dreamed about that car for 15 20 years I would bet. Oh yeah. Yeah, I had the, yeah. I had the poster when I was a kid. I you know, I I had it I had the poster, I had the magazines. I was I was obsessed. So did it exceed your expectations? Where where did where did, it sounds like it did, but I just Yeah, oh it. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It definitely does. Yeah, especially cuz throughout the early 2000s when I started being able to drive 
what was currently on sale at the time, Murcielagos, Gallardos, Ferrari 360s, and stuff like that, at that time, Countach was minimum cool. Yeah. You know, yeah. and and really, everyone was like, ah, that they're kind of a piece of junk. Eh. And I drove, I had drove like a friend who had a shop, and he let me drive one, like just kind of around, you know, briefly. But I now know it was ice cold. It wasn't really running that great to begin with. It wasn't a really high quality example, and it was clunky. And my car is better than that. <laughs> so, <Right>. so, <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, it it has. It's it's if you're if you're and if you talk to people who have got them, there's two types of Countach owners. It doesn't move, or they drive it all the time. There's the only there's almost nothing in between. Um, Jay Leno drives his all the time. I know all eight people that have a Countach in Los Angeles County <laughs> that I know that I know of that that take them out, and they all they all drive them. They all drive them a bunch. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Got to drive them to keep them running well. Yeah. Driving well, it, keep, driving it with... keeps it running better, running well, better than almost any other thing you could do. You know, we yeah. service it frequently. Yeah. I do oil changes every two thousand miles, and you know, and and we we service it frequently. But 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 you know, preventative, right? Right, right. Well, the next <clears throat> car on your list threw me a little bit. Actually, a couple of your cars threw me a little bit. The Bentley Continental SC, nineteen ninety nine. That one oh, threw me a little bit. So good, right? Short wheelbase, wide body, big engine removable targa roof i mean that is you know that is as close as you got to that period uh, to to coach building like in the old school way you know it was it was the last of that run of bentley's before volkswagen took over um you know big six and three quarter twin turbo motor you know stately but with the short wheelbase also kind of sporty almost also like a homologation rally car you know or something like that and um you know uh rare enough that uh you know cool enough especially with the target top that you didn't have to be a supercar enthusiast to know you were looking at something very cool uh, right. especially with those box flares um but if you did know what you were looking at it was like oh that's what that is you know and right. and right. um you know the continental um R and the T's, which which were regular, you know, there's the regular wheelbase, the short wheelbase, and then this was the most extreme one where you could take the roof off, also. And I just think that that is very cool. I love those cars. Isn't this isn't this one they describe the horsepower as more than adequate? You know, they want to give you the those. I think those were Rolls Royces. They they oh, these right. were those these were, were the Royces. Bentleys were always like <laughs> uh, I think these were around four hundred and twenty five horsepower, I believe, and probably five hundred pounds of torque. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, this next one threw me again for a little bit. I get why, but it did throw me initially. A Ferrari F three five five GTS six speed. Tell us why that car and not other manual Ferraris of the same era. Well, that car is the best. I mean, I, I could have put F50 on there, but if I really had to choose F40 or F50, I think I'd probably prefer the F40. But um, the 355, in my opinion, is the is the best sounding, uh, and and it, it, it it's the be- It's a perfect balance between that old school wedge shape that began in the 80s. And and carry you know with the Testarossa and and ended with the 355. Um, this engine that used parts from the Formula One engine, which made it sound so spectacular. I mean, po- the best Ferrari V8 sound I think ever. Uh, the gated six-speed manual. Yeah. Um, so you had your gates, but you didn't have the dog leg to deal with, which in traffic sucks. Um, the GTS means you have the benefits of a convertible, but without any kind of power mechanism. You just latch and unlatch the the roof. Um, I love a G. Anytime, right. anytime Ferrari has offered a GTS model, whether it was a 308, 328, 348, 355, or now the 812, anytime they've offered it, it's been the best version of the car. Period. Right. I'll die on that hill. Pick pick your model. <laughs> the GTS was the best one. Um, Daytona GTS four the, cam. I mean. Daytona, yeah, Daytona GTS four cam as well. Absolutely, and so, um, so yeah. I mean, you know, old school style, modern enough. 
uh, to drive in a traffic jam or in the city and know you're not going to smoke the clutch, you're not going to overheat it, you know, um, and, and fast enough to be a really good time, great sounding, good gearing, and if you had all the money in the world, you'd have an entire extra powertrain on a stand. So when it came time to service it, you would just swap the powertrain in, and then they could service the other engine on the stand. You know That's what I'm right. saying? Yeah. Now, the next one on your list, I totally get. This is on my list. The Ferrari 550 Barchetta six-speed manual. Yeah. Tell us why that car, and why not the Super America? Um, because... Uh, assuming, uh, I don't, I get to buy all of these 10 cars on the list. I don't just, right. I don't just have to pick one off of the list. Um, the idea of a GT Ferrari where you have to commit to not having a roof with you at all is G. I like that. <laughs> right. Um, the Super America, I like it's got that electrochromic glass, which I think was very neat for the time, but I don't like how it looks when the roof yeah, is flipped open. And I really like, I like, you know, you show up somewhere that's more than f 100 miles from where you live in a Barchetta, <laughs> and, you, you know, you've made a commitment. <laughs> and I like that. I like that very much. I think and it's also, one of the yeah, that was also the first Ferrari I ever got to drive. A family friend owned one, and so the the first first Ferrari I ever had to go in was a a five fifty Barchetta. Yeah, yeah, and they're one of the prettiest. I mean, just the roll bars in the back and the way yeah, the they're cool. Cover. I mean, yeah. it's just it's just gorgeous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, the next one is related to the Coutage, but it's a little bit later. The Diablo, but the six point GT. So this is the rear wheel drive only. Is that right? Yeah, the D, the GT was is is rear wheel drive. It was sort of a lightweight. Um, it was the homologation for their fairly lame GT1 effort when they went racing with Diablos for like a second. Um, but but it was um, it, it was very light and very raw, and it was you know manual gearbox. They they had started working with carbon fiber quite a bit, so it's got it's got carbon on the interior and stuff. Uh, and it, it was the 6.0, so it was a post Audi takeover. So you were left with. Uh, you had Diablo styling, but uh, and it was still fundamentally the Lamborghini powertrain. But 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 Audi had really gone through it by then and made sure that it was um, it's the usability was up to um, to 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 the kind of standards that Volkswagen Audi Group could could stand behind. Um, you know, it's it's the last of the original pre-merger, you know, Lambos. Um, before Audi had really any influence on the design whatsoever. Um, and, um, you know, raw, manual, V12, doors go yeah. up, very pretty, um, but uh, but still, you, you know, drivable, usable, you know. Right. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. All right, we got three more to go. Uh, let's see. The next one's a Porsche 964 Turbo 3.6 liter. That's actually one of my. That was the first turbo I really fell in love with. Is that the one that has the uh, kills bugs fast poster? I think. Uh, I don't remember if it was that or if that one, that poster might have been the nine nine three turbo. That was a you know, might have been the nine nine three. Yeah, that was a Zwart poster. Uh, the the turbo three six was the bad boys post the uh, car. The, from the first Bad Boys, when they had the drag race down <laughs> oh, the runway yeah. with the Shelby yeah. Cobra, um, and so so that 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 was his its Hollywood moment for me. But um, the turbo is the last that that's the last of the of the rear wheel drive uh, turbo cars, you know, with a sing with single turbocharger instead of twin. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I love a nine, six, four. I think it's, uh, I think they're modern enough to use every single day and they still have enough of the old school feel. Um, and, and as far as nine, six, fours go, um, unless you could either, you could either go in the RS direction, uh, or you could go in the, in the turbo direction. And for me, if I had to pick one, I would go in, uh, in the turbo direction. So yeah, the, the turbo three, six is the, is the big dick daddy. Oh, excuse me. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the big daddy of of uh, of air cooled uh, turbo cars, and they're very rare. We ver we don't see them very often, even here in California, where we see all the Porsches. Yeah. Right, right. Well, speaking of which, the next one, second from last, is the nine eleven R from two thousand sixteen, which I just think sure. they hit that thing out of the ballpark. I just think sure. that thing's gorgeous. 
Yeah, I mean that's the kind of car where I would I would buy one new, uh, and, and I would just put put all the miles on it. I mean I would just drive it as a as a car. You know, it's easy enough to use as a as an everyday car. Uh, it's a blast in the canyons. I've had them at the limit on the racetrack, and they're they're light and agile and and very fast. They sound great. I love the throwback houndstooth interior. Um, if I'm really spending, you know, real money, uh, it's only incrementally better than the 911 GT3 Touring, which is a lot cheaper. But we're not spending real money. We're playing with That's fake right. money. And if we're going to play with fake money, then I'm going to get the more expensive one. <laughs> That's right. No, I love the way you think. All right. The last one, which I saw this one coming just based on some of our conversations. Lancia 037, one of the Group B cars, right? Yeah, that's uh, that is a Group B rally car. Um, it's one of those cars that it, it doesn't even, you know, they made a street version. It doesn't even really look like it should have a street version. <laughs> you right. know, it's it, it actually looks a lot like the Ford RS 200 in that the front and the back look like they're from completely different cars. <laughs> um, and um, honestly, um, I like how they look. I th I like the, the connection to homologation Group B uh, cars. But the reason I put that on there is because I've spent a lot of time driving that thing in uh, in video games, and I think <laughs> at least in Forza, it drives absolutely brilliantly. And if it drives anything like that in real life, I uh, would not be disappointed in that at all. So, is that one of the rare cars you have not driven? Uh, I've also not driven a Diablo GT uh, okay. on this list. What else? I think there might be something else in the list I've never driven as well. Um, I've driven a 964 Lancia. Turbo, but I've never driven a Turbo 3.6. So That's splitting hairs. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. No, I've never driven a Diablo GT either. Um, so, yeah, I have not driven a Lancia 037 in real life. I've, I've driven one in, in video games only. I've driven a Stratos and... Um, that's certainly unique. Uh, and I've driven Delta Integrale, you know, uh, both rally cars and, and street cars. And I've driven, uh, a Fulvia as well, which is okay. an incredibly disappointing car to drive. <laughs> um, um, the Stratos is very unique. I didn't like it very much, but I understand why somebody would like it. And I understand its importance in history. And it certainly would be, a you know, the, the, an excellent addition to a, a, a Group B collection of, of, or, or really an Italian collection or just a collection of awesome stuff. <laughs> well, I know we're playing with fake money here, but if I add up the approximate values of all the cars in your ultimate garage, you are somewhere around $29 million. Well, so I better get to uh, work, huh? You get better get to work. <laughs> <laughs> I better park a lot of cars down here. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. You got some great taste. I appreciate your time on that. Now, one thing I do at the end here, and I don't remember if I gave you a heads up on this. I play a little game I call Keep Cash and Crush. So mm -hmm. I give you three cars. I understand. Yeah, there's another uh, There's another version of it that is uh, FMK, and uh, yeah, uh, I don't yeah, want to yeah. – I assume, right. I assume right. the rules are the same? The rules are the same. Okay. Yeah, there's one you're going to have to keep forever, one you're going to have right. to cash in, and then yes. one you're going to have to crush. Got it. That is, that is where I got the idea. Um Okay, so here are your three cars. I'm going to, I said I want to pick any of your ultimate cars in your garage there, but I'm going to pick the Group B rally cars. Little curveball here. Um, I'm going to pick an Audi Quattro, mm -hmm. the Lancia Delta Integrale, mm -hmm. and then the Ford RS2000. Okay. Um, and the Ford, I assume you mean the mid engine one and not the variant of the Escort? <laughs> the <initial one. laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, well, I would I would have to sell the R, get rid of the RS Ford because it's very cool. But I tried to sit in one once. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it just it was not good. It wasn't. It wasn't even. It wasn't good. Yeah, it wasn't good. Um, I would. Uh, and then what was the other one? The Lancia and the, oh, the Quattro. Um, yeah, Quattro. I would keep the Lancia forever. Ah. Okay. And I would, um, what is the other option? Cash? Cr crush. Crush. Oh, yeah. Cr I'd crush the Audi, keep the uh, keep the Lancia, and uh, and get rid of the uh, sell the Ford. 
Okay, those are pretty good choices. I would, uh, uh, a friend of mine owns an S1 Quattro, Sport Quattro, short wheelbase, street car. Is that, is that Zuck? It's, it's Zuckerman. I've driven it. I've driven Zuckerman's car. You're going to crush his car? You know, that is a car that when it was it was here for my grand opening at Westside Collector Car Storage, and we had it up on the racks, and I loved looking at it every day. It was really, really cool to look at every day. But I also drove it, and I just didn't care for how it drove. It drove because of the short wheelbase. The handling is very twitchy. I know why it had a short wheelbase, but let me just say that Hans Stuck didn't like the short wheelbase either. He continued <laughs> to race the long wheelbase as long as they let him, and he didn't like the short wheelbase ever. It's for, like, the Monte Carlo rally. It, it actually... It uh it handled like the like the uh it steered like the Stratos actually <laughs> strangely <laughs> enough, um and I and you know considering how much those things cost and um, they cost a lot, um I don't think the driving experience alone uh, justifies the, their cost, whereas a, a really nice Delta Integrale Evo you know is like eighty thousand bucks, and that's a lot you know that's collector grade. But it's a lot easier to swallow that than it is for four hundred for an S one Quattro that steers weird. <laughs> you know, well, I love the fact you probably crushed the most expensive one, so I appreciate that. Just be sure to probably. tell Zuckerman you uh, probably you, you crushed his car. I'm glad he has one. Zuckerman has excellent taste. I mean, Zuckerman, oh, you know, and 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 he knows what to buy and when to buy it and where to buy it and when to sell it. I mean, he's he's a very smart guy. He's a very astute car collector so as part of a 15 or 20 car collection i think that's yeah. an excellent piece to have you know yeah. what i'm talking about uh Absolutely. but if the alternative is <laughs> keep it forever or crush it right now <laughs> i don't want it forever you feel me you know yeah yeah well right. awesome man yeah i appreciate your time today tell our listeners again where they can find you uh, you can find the landing page for everything is the smoking tire.com, but you can also find our, uh, my car reviews at uh, youtube.com slash the smoking tire, my podcast at youtube.com slash the smoking tire podcast, or anywhere you download podcasts like iTunes and Google and Spotify and blah, 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 blah. Uh, I write uh, car reviews for Road and Track. If I, I write kind of like I talk. So if you want to see my voice in, in writing, that's pretty much what you're getting uh, there. And if you're in Los Angeles and you need some place to keep a very special car, uh, short term or long, Westside Collector Car Storage in Playa Vista. Awesome, man. Well, thank Thanks, you so Rick. much for your time today, Matt. Of course. Thank you.